get passionate. Right. So yeah. there's an awful lot of people who think passion and happiness uh, happen to you. Yeah. They don't happen to you. You decide them. Mm -hmm. um, because passion for something gets you up in the morning. It keeps you up at night when that's what's needed. Yes. It 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 gives you the reason to get out of bed in the morning because you know the thing you're going to is something you you really want to go to. Yeah. Right. And it might be hard. I'm not saying it's always easy, but it's still something you're passionate about solving or, or getting over, uh, etc. So good morning and welcome to another episode of Back to Business, Better Life. Today I'm pretty excited because I've got Naomi Valentine here, who is not only the founder of Partners Life, but also my husband's boss. <laughs> so it's quite exciting to have her in the room. Welcome to the show, Naomi. Thanks, Deborah. Hey. Delighted to be here. Lovely to have you here. Hey, um, we were just having a quick chat before we started the, the cameras rolling, and you were telling me a little bit about your history in the whole insurance industry. I wonder if you wouldn't mind sharing that and also sharing a little bit about what you're most proud of, both professionally and personally. Yeah, I, I fell into the industry by accident. Um, I needed a job. Um, I was at university doing marine biology, as you do when you go into finance. <laughs> and um, but I needed to, I needed to work. And um, you know, I come from a poor background. I didn't have any idea of anything to do with money because uh, we didn't have any. And mm -hmm. we sure as heck didn't talk about it. So um, I saw a job advertised. It said management trainee life insurance, and I thought management trainee sounds like me. Yeah idea what life insurance is but I'm sure I'll learn give it a go. I'll give it a go yeah, <laughs> yeah. and um and um fell into it in that way um and very quickly found out it was an awful structure of an industry very old school old-fashioned the sort of are you being served old Mr Young Mr Grace kind of idea with you can go up one step one grade each year if you're good and male um and you know and the girls will one day get married and have kids um and you know the customer really didn't even come into the conversation mm -hmm. but we were in an industry uh, that paid out money in the end when people died uh, to the surviving family. So the purpose of the industry intrigued me, but the structure of the industry was just awful. But it's it's how I got my start. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I guess, um, you know, what's kept me there is the feedback from the customers. You know, when they bought a product they didn't want, didn't think they needed, didn't want to pay for, thought it was way too expensive, and then you pay out money at the worst possible time in their lives. That changes their life. It just removes that stress, uh, which is enormous. Yes. Yeah. And uh, and they're so desperately grateful. Uh, that keeps you coming back for more. I love it. And so this isn't your first time, though, is it? I mean, yeah. Partners Life is the second um, bite of the cake, if you like. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about the, the first company that you started. Yeah, I started a company called Club Life. I had been the founding employee of Sovereign oh, yeah. uh, back in the start of Sovereign. So I had effectively built all of the sort of operational structures uh, for Sovereign over the 13 years that I was there. Mm -hmm. So I knew I had the experience and probably one of the only people who had the experience to actually build a life insurance company from scratch um, but I had never raised funds for it found reinsurance for it you know done the financial side of it um, but having left Sovereign when ASB had bought it I figured they would change it and so there'd be an opportunity with the distribution force and customer base for another Sovereign you know a modern um, forward-looking innovative company um, so I thought well if anyone can, I can, and I'm sure I can learn that bit. So, you know, <laughs> and, and so, you know, I, I started Club Life, which I later sold to ING, ran it as ING Life for a large number of years mm -hmm. um, before I left just as ANZ Bank bought it. Oh. You can see this trend. The bank's are always in that buying. Yeah. <laughs> and they're not, I don't know. Yeah. My, my personal opinion is I'm not sure they're great places to work. <laughs> I, I just don't think they understand the long term permanence and the yeah. impact of life insurance. Sure. It's not transactional banking. Yeah. And if you apply transactional banking, management technique to it you break it and that's what i mean it's not the banks aren't good at what they do but i don't think yeah. insurance is their core competency yeah, yeah. Oh, fantastic okay so personal professional best what are you most proud of in your life so far um personally what i'm most proud of is the magnificent person that my son has oh. grown into yes um and i and i'll give a little bit of background i mean everybody wants to say that about their kids but but you know when i had chris i went straight back to work when he was six months old mm. and everybody told me that that was a terrible thing to do, other than my mother, who, by the way, had been a stay-at-home mum. Oh, I wasn't expecting that, but yeah. she was, and she helped me by looking after him, and I paid her to do that. But So she facilitated that to happen. Mm -hmm. But everybody had an opinion about what a terrible mother I was mm -hmm. uh, and how damaged my child was going to be and, and how spoiled my child was going to be and all of those sorts of things. And he is now a 33-year-old, married to the best daughter-in-law 
uh, you know, just the best person yeah. um, and happy and uh, successful and driven and he loves his mum. Yeah. And I go, wow, uh, thanks for all your feedback, but I win. Yeah. Um, and so to know that, you know, I've played a part in another person's happiness in that way um, is just just the joy yeah. of my life um, and you know I keep pitching myself that I get to call those two my kids <laughs> um, so that's the, I'm sure they don't like me calling them kids but and and professionally it's it's interesting I'm so proud of those companies that I've built but their companies are not what I consider to be um, a legacy yeah. Um, actually, the legacy I think is the uh, the changing of the industry that comes from making competitors compete. And in the earlier days, it was those old days: are you being served, male dominated? Who cares about the customer? Old boys clubs mm-hmm. that uh, first of all poo pooed me, and then suddenly had to compete with me. And and in the needing to compete because the products are better and the service was better and the, and the dis- the relationship with the distributors were better and staff wanted to work, you know, and suddenly you have to change. It meant that they needed to change the mindset of people that were running those businesses in order to be able to compete. Mm. Effectively, the whole industry shifted yeah. as a result of that and is so much better now than it ever was. And you just need to look at the comparison between Australia and New Zealand. Australia Royal Commission, mm. Australia was still terrible right up until not many years ago, um, whereas New Zealand had not but it was there was still a lot of stuff that wasn't great but it certainly wasn't Australia like and you'd have to say that's because much more competitive market and nobody could get away with that Mm -hmm. Um, and I was a part of that Mm -hmm. and I feel incredibly proud for New Zealand that um, you know maybe I short-circuited that in some way. You certainly did I can see that I know that Steve often comes home he tells me about the great things that happens at Partners Life and you know you've got your Friday morning sessions you're with a team you've got great team building events but um, tell me about your because you're right the people can make a huge difference how do you treat people differently do you think than others? I, oh, that's a multifaceted thing. But sure. I think in the first instance is who you choose to have around you. But who do you, who do you choose to recruit? Um, and the industry and the recruitment industry is notorious for saying, what kind of experience do you need to have? Oh, you need 10 years experience in this particular discipline. Yeah. So it cuts out anybody that's different. Mm-hmm. That's come from a different background, that has a different perspective, that is a different sex <laughs> or ethnicity or because... 10 years ago, that's what everybody looked looked like. And White people, males. <laughs> yeah. People only recruited people just like themselves. Yes. So if you don't consciously break that mould, then you will continue that trend. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and monogamy, a monogamous of, you know, an employee base is the thing that keeps you stuck in one place, right? The thing that moves you forward is different ideas. Yeah. Um, and so one is being uh, free to say that that stuff, doesn't matter. What I'm looking for is attitude, aptitude, intellect, um, and difference. <laughs> so I don't want two people the same. I want you know that person to be different from the next person you recruit, and so on. Oh, part of it is conscious. Part of it is unconscious. I don't have a degree. I'm not a white male. I'm actually Pacifica, <laughs> and in and more and more Pacifica even in my thinking than I am in in, in my genetic. actual genetic, yeah, yep. and certainly the way I look, right? So, um, so you know, that kind of difference, I think, you attract it because mm. you're not rejecting it, and um, and as a result of that, you get a much more uh, challenging but also um, innovative um, environment. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, I think then it is understanding your role. So I surround myself with people who are all better than me. My executive team, the team underneath them, they're all super, super, super good yeah. at what they do. Um, I know what they do. I know what I expect them to do and I can ask questions. I know enough about every part of my business and that's what you have to do when you're a founder. Yeah. Um, to, to know how to challenge them. But I also know that they are better than me. My job is to is to lead them mm-hmm. um, and to and to get them to want to follow me to a place they wouldn't have gone by themselves. Yeah, to give them the confidence that we collectively can do that and that the people, all the people around them collectively um, will make the best decision. Not one person because you're the expert at that. Yeah. You are the expert at that. So no one can sort of challenge you on that. You're safe in that knowledge. So why not let everybody else have a, have a point of view as well on their, on your thing? Mm-hmm. Uh, because ultimately something might spark you to go, it's not quite right, but oh, that, that's a good idea. Like, let me go away and think about that. So 
as a, an executive team, we have always, I've always run it that we talk about everything, mm -hmm. every topic, every problem, every opportunity in every area of the company collectively. And then we make a collective decision. And if we can't decide, I decide. <laughs> that's your role, right? Yeah. But, and then that's our decision. And then we collectively support that. That's how it's always been. It does a couple of things, gives you the best answers. Mm -hmm. You get the best ideas. Yep. You get that. It gives everyone buy-in. So you all know why you're doing things. You know what's happening. You know you've had an input. So there's nobody going out going, I need to create natural terrible. And you get that politics yeah. um, in an organization. And it teaches everybody stuff. Everybody around that table, every time we have a discussion about a topic, yep. learns more. Yeah about something they are not experts at, to become more experts so they can do my job, mm -hmm. right? So if I fall over by a bus, everybody knows exactly what I know. Um, and I think that that has worked really well for us. And it's not what everyone does, but no. it's certainly what I do. It, it sounds like we do at EOS. We basically have a, a leadership team that is um, involved in every decision. And like you said, there's one person who ultimately holds the casting vote if required. But in general, you're actually asking for diversity of the leadership team to, to come up with the best possible solution. And in fact, we encourage them to, first of all, make sure they've really identified the real issue and then discuss all the possible solutions. And it's surprising. Sometimes the answers come from somebody who you least expect it to. Um, for example, one of the companies I was working with, uh, they had a, a cash flow issue and it was a company that produced food and it was actually the chef that came up with the answer in terms of saving money. Now, if that discussion had only been had at the financial table, yes. we may not have got there. Yeah, I uh, 100% um, agree with that. How did that chef feel after that? Yeah, oh, amazing. I mean, because he's actually contributing. As you said, he's got the buy-in. Um, yeah. He's contributed to actually making the decision. He understands why it has to be made. Because I think sometimes, um, particularly, I mean, I worked for Tower for a long time, those kind of hierarchical organisations, when an order comes down from above, you just do it because you're told to without truly understanding it, which means you're not really bought into it. And so at every opportunity, you might find a, you know, a way to, to bend the rules where actually if you're involved in the decision from the beginning, you can go, okay, I understand why that has to be done. I'm happy to take that on board. Yeah. And I think the other half of it too is out of the executive team needs to come communication mm. to the wider organisation about what we discussed and why we discussed it and what we've decided. Yeah. Uh, and also to give staff who've contributed to that executive's mm. opinion, yep. you know, the comfort that their opinion has counted mm. and it's been heard and it's been fed through, right? So, so the communication is an enormously important part of the organization's buy-in. Like you said, just do this because mm -hmm. uh, is the is the first step to everybody going, um, work to rule, you know, that, that kind of, and I hate this company and they don't listen to me. Yeah. And we hear that all over the place. And largely it's not necessarily true, but it feels that way mm -hmm. because there isn't this communication channel. So you talked about Friday feedback. Yes. Yeah. It's exactly like this is what we decided this week. <laughs> this is what we've been struggling with this week. This is why we do it. What happens when you build up that kind of trust where people go, I get why we're doing this, is when they don't get why you're doing something, like COVID hits, for example, mm -hmm. or economic stress hits and you have to make structural decisions about the company you have to start cutting back on staff for example and you obviously yeah. can't go into details about stuff like that <laughs> yeah with every staff member they trust you yes um and they 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 might go okay i don't understand why we're doing this but i trust that you do mm -hmm. and when you can you'll tell me yeah um about it and that has that has, you know, delivered it's some good, yeah, really yeah. good outcomes to us. So I'm really interested because obviously, you know, Partners Life, how many staff have you got now? Well, we've now got just under 400. Under 400. Wow, gosh, it's grown so quickly, hasn't yeah, it? Yes. So that's been in 12 years. So when yes. you first started, it would have been you and three, 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 of, three of you. Three yes. of you. Yeah. And now you've got just under 400 people. Yeah. So obviously communication becomes more and more difficult the bigger the complexity of the organisation. What have you done to try and sort of simplify that down and ensure that people yeah. um, do get to be involved? It's a really good question. So mm. we've always intended to communicate um, and the hardest part is how you do it so you use all staff emails and you do monthly town hall meetings we get all the staff together um, that's what we used to do right um, and it it was okay but it's it's not um, instant it's not fast enough it's yep. not and then COVID hit and everybody had to go work from home and we decided that the best way to keep managing people feeling like they still belong to a team is let them see each other on the screen everybody and talk to them yeah you know once a week uh, online hey 
guess what? It's a fantastic medium yep. for communicating with people. So we keep doing it. Mm. Um, and we still do it. Even if 90% of the people are in the office, Just Friday it. feedback is online. Ah. And so you build all your techniques about the games that you play and the chat, you know, the way people use chat yes. and all of that sort of thing as if everyone was at home mm-hmm. um, and online and that was the only way they were consuming that. And it has worked exceptionally well, thank God for COVID, yes. <laughs> for that and for the workplace flexibility because... COVID forced us to go, everybody can work from home. So if they want to, why not? not? Yep. And our world changed completely as a result of that and has remained so. And it's been magnificent. Mm. It's actually really interesting. I know of another insurance company that um, during the lockdowns actually wouldn't allow video conferencing because I think maybe their service couldn't come. I don't know what the reason was, but they tried to do everything online without any visual, yeah. um, any, any video which is actually really, really tough because I don't know about you, I, I love the fact that I can see somebody engage with somebody. Listening to somebody without seeing them would, would just, I would switch off completely. Yeah, and part of the charm of our Friday feedback sessions is they're not formal. Yep. They're not me in a suit, okay. um, yeah. you know, reading a script that someone else wrote for me as if the staff were a, an audience from the outside. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, we're a team, right? So I'm a bit of a goofball and... <laughs> You know, and if it's a, if it's Friday, we have casual Fridays, and I don't have any meetings. Yep. You know, I, I I try to wear something that will amuse people. You know, um, you know, did videos from you know calls from home when we were in lockdown, and people could see all the audience I had on my shelf because I didn't put a background on it because you know they're at home, I'm at home, I want them to see I'm in the same boat. Yeah. And so they'd all make funny comments about them as I try to move them around to see if anyone noticed. And you know, so you have to be you is yeah. what I'm saying. And the mostly for me that is visual because yep. you can see I'm very expressive in my face I smile a lot mm-hmm. um, and I want them to know I'm smiling yeah um, and um, and I want to see them and they want to see each other yes. I don't imagine that we would have got anywhere near as close to um, you know the outcome that we've had if people couldn't see mm, I yeah. completely agree so what's been the biggest challenge for you because I mean I, I know that you've had some great success and well done on that but there must have been some times when things were really tough and you're wondering why why you did it the second time round. <laughs> yeah, the um, the biggest challenges. Um, uh, there's not a biggest challenge. Okay. Uh, but when challenges come, they're always big. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're running a financial services business, it's regulated. The job that we do in people's lives is enormously important. You're dealing with huge mon- amounts of money, mm-hmm. um, and you've got huge numbers of staff. You know, who've come on a startup journey with you. So yep. you know, they've risked a lot to c- to come along with you. Um, then every hurdle that you hit is a potential risk to are we even going to survive this, yes. right? Yep. And so when you have those moments, that's when it feel, you feel most alone, mm-hmm. yeah? Because in the end, in a crisis, that's when a leader leads, right? That's when people need someone to trust. And so you can't burden them mm-hmm. yep. with how scared you are. You, you need to give them confidence. We've got this, you know. It's all under control. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> all of your panic is your own. Um, and you have to be able to, to deal with that. Um, and so the way I deal with those moments, and there's lots of them, and there'll be less of them now that we have all of the financial support of a global Japanese yes. insurer. <laughs> totally. So that that uh, capital raising and all of that, that's that's not an issue anymore. You've still yeah. got the same challenge of regulators and conduct and do the right thing by customers and all of those challenges but at least the money part for a startup business yep. is such a big part of that um but for me i you know i need to, to have a circuit break to stop my brain from thinking mm. um so a couple of things i i run i hate long distance running um because i'm not good I, i'm cut out to be a sprinter yep. but i love the solitude and I, I go into the bush i take my two little dogs in mm. the bush you know, you're worried about falling over the tree roots and the <laughs> mud and slipping. Yeah. And so the breathing is not as much of an issue. It's beautiful, mm-hmm. you know, so you're dead silent. Yep. And have you ever seen dogs run in the bush whilst leash? Oh, my yeah. God, the tails, you know, like the, <laughs> the absolute joy. What dogs do you have? I've got a mini- miniature pincer yes. and an affin pincer shih tzu oh, cross. Oh, beautiful. So they're both literal. Yeah, yeah. And they are my babies yeah. um and um, so and, you know we've got our two and we, yeah. so steve and i go um into the forest on our bikes and they kind of chase yeah. along behind us and they just love yeah. it and because i think that's our start well. little dogs yeah. need to stop start they can't run continuously yes yeah oh, i need to stop start <laughs> um but but the joy of it like yeah. it, so you, it just completely clears your brain 
Mm-hmm. And you don't know you're not thinking, you just don't realise it. But often I'd come out of the bush and a spark of an idea yes. would have been there because of the stress. But even if it hadn't, at least I'd had that respite for long enough that you you can fill your tank and get going again. Yeah. Um, so that's that's one way in which I do it. The other way is just by sort of breathing and visualising a point in time past the problem mm-hmm. um, when you're through it and you're looking back and laughing about how worried you were, right? So, so almost like a relieving the pressure yes. long enough to look back and, and, and almost by doing that you've seen the pathway that you took to, to, to get past it as well mm-hmm. um, and usually I come out with the, at least the next tiny step and momentum gets you there mm-hmm. taking a step leads to the next step and the next step but being frozen in that place and not moving is the worst possible thing that can happen to you so you, you have to find a way to relieve the panic because you're going to feel it yeah. because you've got so much at stake um, but and the more you you get through, yeah. the more you it's know. You build. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And the more confidence you've got, like like I haven't, I haven't counted this before, but I'm sure I can figure it out. Yeah. You're not alone. You've still got all the experience of everybody else that's fed into you behind you. Mm-hmm. But in that moment, there there pretty much is only you. Yeah. Um, with the with the scale and size of the, you know, of the problem. Yeah. Do you have any sort of peer groups or things that you're a part of? I mean, how do you get um, your your support? I mean, obviously your leadership team is there to support you, but That's beyond right. that, what else do you have? Well, I have, you know, my husband, interestingly, not from an industry point of view. Ah, He's so, been in the industry, but not in yeah. any similar kind of roles. But from a, I can scream and rant and rave and, yeah. and tell him about all the terrible people I've had to <laughs> deal with, or, you know, in various organisations or whatever. He doesn't know any of them, but yeah. he's like cheerleader, number yes. one. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, and not in a super filly, a silliest way, but just I know you. Yep. You've got this. It's okay. Mm-hmm. You're going to be fine. You know, yeah. you've done this before. You know, that, that kind of stuff. Um, always 100% on your side. And that's been an enormously important role for me for 40 years, right? Mm-hmm. We're um, so lucky to have a husband that's not trying to compete with me on the job front yep. um, that he can be there for me. Not, not not seeing each weakness as a well I'm better at what I do but uh, yeah. as a like we, we did, we're in this together because yeah. what you do is is effectively what we do um, so there's that um, and that's my son who yes. uh, who is does know the industry incredibly smart and thinks differently from me okay. uh, less emotional much more analytic he will go and research a million things before he forms an opinion on it you know that, that kind finder. of stuff. Yeah. 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 Um, but then he'll form an opinion and then he'll so just another perspective on things um, is another way of doing it um, and, and and he's been capable of doing that since he was a young teenager so I kind of feel like I've had two adults in my life where I can bounce or bend but who aren't telling me what to do mm. um and i haven't that's really good yeah i haven't really felt that i've needed any more than that okay. yeah well, that makes perfect sense so going back to so one of the things you talked about was obviously going off into the forest and we call those clarity breaks and yeah. i think well, leaders often don't understand that when you're so busy fighting the fires and you've got all that stress going on you either aren't capable of making decisions yeah. or you make the wrong decisions because yes. you're making it under a huge amount of yes. pressure yeah. um so for, for you it's going off into the forest um for other people it could just be just getting away yeah. getting away from technology um you know just doing something that actually gets you out of the everyday environment and just allowing yourself to, to breathe and to yeah. to have that clarity of thought yeah for me the busyness of running i yeah. guess stops me from thinking yes. because what i need to do is stop thinking yeah. not, not go to another place where i've got plenty of time to think more just not helping me because all i do is lie there you get to the end of it go oh i don't know what just happened was yeah. that good i don't uh, know yeah, yeah. i missed it all <laughs> and i think i think you're right and I, i'm an active relaxer too so i think the the cycling is the same for us because when you're cycling or even though a lot of it is kind of intuitive as it's running, yeah. you're still always looking out, you're still looking around, you're not able to, to do an awful lot of thinking yeah. while you're doing it. So it yeah. gives that kind of clarity and support. Yeah. 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 Okay, interesting. Um, in terms of um, your leadership team, how often do you meet with them and how do you get their input into the business decisions and things that you've talked about? We sit together. Yep. Um, so when we physically, because again, ah, yep. some of them are working from home, but when we physically uh, and together, we, we have a community. We're all open plan, have always been open plan. No one's ever had an office. Right. Um, so we sit within the, the vicinity. There's a t- couple of reasons for that. It means you can shout something at someone about something confidential and not worry that the whole office has heard it, right? <laughs> yes. um, so you can, you know, have these conversations. Um, but it's amazing how often you get up and just go chat to someone who's sitting next to you, right? Yeah. Um, or three doors down about, 
a small thing which ultimately might lead to input into a big thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of um, neighbourhood um, oh, has worked really well. Yeah, we meet once a week, yeah. um, and that's you know both online and in person. Who is in person gets together in a room, and we're all on our laptops, so everybody can see everybody's faces. Yes. And, you know, not a room with a whole bunch of people, and then three people on a big I screen. Know, that's, awful. That, that's awful, and we it's not right. So, um, so we meet once a week quickly and then every fortnight long and then you know every couple of months we do a whole exec off-site nice. to really drill down into all of the individual issues we also do strategy planning each year and and you know whole and we do a actual off-site rotating way yeah. um for you know a couple of days and then bring their families in for the for a couple of days after that to to just give that team opportunity chance to get to know people outside of just the things Mm -hmm. um, that we're dealing with as, as well so nice. you know we, it's a very strong team yeah no I can see that and you've just as you said you just recently um had some investment from the what's in the Daiichi name? Life Daiichi Life yeah um, and that's a big Japanese company isn't it, it it's is. a global um, organization how did that come about and what was the the driving force for that for you it's that's a really interesting one um when I started the company there's two ways that a company exits or gets enough cash over time to become a forever company yeah uh, one is IPO um, mm -hmm. so listing on the stock exchange and the other is a trade sale and um, and in my head the best trade sale own in full partners life right since the day that we started would be Daiichi Life and the reason for that yeah. is Daiichi Life um, had bought town in Australia Tao Australia yeah. Life okay um, not long after partners life started and Tao's trajectory since then had been phenomenal. They were number 10 in the Australian market, they're now number one wow. um, in 10 years, right? Yeah. So, uh, 11 years now. Um, and that was with Daichi Life behind them. I know Brett Clark, who's the managing director of Tao, uh, you know, reasonably well. I've met him a couple of times as Partners Life to just explore some of the neat things they were doing in Australia and That's talk about some of the stuff that we were doing. Yeah. And all of my experiences were they were running TAL exactly the way they wanted to run TAL with full support of Daichi. Oh, that's interesting. So to me, that was the dream mm -hmm. track record. And I've watched other companies be bought by other global organisations who basically just destroyed it. Just, oh, well, no, just, no, sorry, but made them do things the way they did it as opposed right. to keeping the culture. That that's right. Running right. systems out of Australia because there were synergies in that and New Zealand yeah. never got a look at, right? And mm -hmm. that, that was the worst outcome that I could see. Sure. Um, and along the way we'd raise capital, we had private equity shareholders and ultimately they were going to need an exit strategy. So you know at some point you're going to trade sale or IPO, you have yep. to because that's your exit strategy and we're probably right at that time frame now. Mm -hmm. um, but markets are terrible for IPOs at the moment. Yes. Um, and so, you know, our shareholders are going, oh, okay, we're, we're probably going to have to hold on a bit longer, it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and you're going, Ugh. Okay, it's not really what I want from my shareholders because, <laughs> yeah. you know, I might need more capital to do something and then go, oh, and you're going to put more. And I just, you know, I'm just sitting here till I can get out isn't, isn't a fantastic answer. Yes. So, um, and, and but it was just, and we were in the middle of the BNZ transaction, so my head's going, we need to finish oh, this. That's, oh, that was going at the same time. We need to finish yes. this. <laughs> yeah. so, and then we need to think about what happens next, right? right. And um, Daichi approached us. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, and so it's kind of like a storybook <laughs> um, outcome. Um, so, yeah, we, I couldn't have asked for a better outcome mm -hmm. wonderful hey um just in terms of uh, this this podcast is designed to actually help people who are on the journey themselves in terms of building their own sort of private business have you got any tips that you could share with them so we usually ask for one or two three tips that you can just share around you know what you can do if you're i suppose there's a number of things if you're you know growing quite quickly um if you're looking to get more capital into the business um any or just from a personal point of view you know what you'd share yeah, a lot of people ask me, um, you know, small business owners, you know, how do I grow my business, et cetera, mm. but they don't want to borrow any money and they don't want to have other investors come in and own some of the business. <laughs> yeah. um, and they don't want to pay someone, you know, to support them. And even in our industry, you know, advisors who won't pay for an EA. Yeah. Uh, so they do all their admin themselves. Mm. Their salespeople, you know, people people, who are terrible at admin. So yeah. it's the worst possible outcome. They are costing themselves far more in doing that than they ever would by paying someone a salary, but they can't see it. Like So, the, so it's, there's no business sense. Mm -hmm. I also get people who talk about they love the business that they're in, they're passionate about their people, and they make no money. Mm. Yep. But, but you haven't got a business then. No. And I love what I do because of what we do for people, but I'm ruthless about we have to make profit. Sustainability. You've got to be profitable. Yeah. Well, you don't have a business. You can't, you know, if you yep. can't make payroll, 
yeah. or you're worried that you can't make payroll, you haven't got a you haven't got a business, mm-hmm. right? So understand what a business is. Don't be ashamed to want to make money. And even if you want to do good, yeah, right? Make the money, use the money to do yeah, good. That's exactly. Yeah, what because the principles of a, a sustainable business are that it can then carry on doing that in mm-hmm. the long term. Yeah. Um, as opposed to as opposed to not. So I think that's a really important part. Part of a business is having a business plan and demonstrating that you know what the numbers are going to look like, mm-hmm. that you've got reasonableness around what the expectations of what you can achieve are in terms of sales, for example, costs, etc. Uh, and then how much money you need to get to the scale that you need. So if you want to go and talk to an investor yeah. and raise money, it's a, effectively like a prospectus. They know what they're investing in, mm-hmm. you know, and, and so many people don't have a business plan. They say things to me like, I don't know where to start. You go, well, you write up what purpose it is. What business are you in? Yes. <laughs> What's your why you and not someone else? Mm-hmm. Why would someone want your product or your service compared yep. to someone else? So who's your competition, mm-hmm. and, and how are you going to stand out? Yep. Are you going to do the same as them, just cheaper, or are you going to do different thing than them? And and how are you going to tell people about you? You know, I, I've had so many people come and say, "I built this fantastic system. Mm-hmm. Now, Naomi, help me get it out there." <laughs> I go, "Well, you you've decided to be a software developer." And you don't have a marketing plan. Yeah. Yeah. And do you know how much it costs to be a, you know, just to continue to support software once you've got it out there and people are licensing it, paying for it? Mm-hmm. You've got an obligation, right? And you've yeah, got yeah, so standards and, and, and cyber security and all this sort of stuff. Oh. You know, so I used to work at the Ice House, and so yeah, I had a lot of that sort of stuff. That. Where they come in and go, we've got this amazing product. We spent two hundred thousand dollars building it, and you go, so how much are you spending on marketing? Oh, we haven't got money for marketing. Then you don't, you're not going to have a business because just because you build it does no. not mean you'll get customers. And understanding also what the customer actually really wants, and as what you've built might sound like a great idea, but is it actually genuinely meeting yeah. their pain points? Yeah, well, yeah. our, our industry is really hard. People yeah. don't want to buy our products. They don't yeah. want to talk about death and dying. They don't want to talk <laughs> about money, and they don't want to pay for anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and and, you know, and so, but but there's a, a, a fundamental need yeah. for the product. So you know that, you know, we can get in front of you, we mm-hmm. can show you that, right? Yeah. But it's expensive to get in front of you and show you that. So we assume it's going to be expensive to get in front of you and show you that, and we have to make money, yeah. you know, from, from being able to do that, right? And it's huge amounts of money um, in our business. So, but it applies big or small. You've got to know how you're going to make money, how much money you expect to make. And, and then if the plan stop panning out you've got to change something yeah. not wait and then wait till you fail and then go oh it didn't turn out like <laughs> yeah good fail fast and yeah. pivot if you need and to yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah exactly yeah, right so okay so we're just repeat so the first thing is i mean delegate without a doubt i'm not i'm a big fan of this yeah. because at the end of the day we shouldn't be doing 25 dollars an hour work um anything that you're not good at or you don't like should be given to somebody else and That's elevate right. yourself up to what you're really really good at right. and what your unique ability is next thing is make sure you've got a plan um, and I think we've actually got a thing called a VTO. It answers eight questions. You know, what are your core yeah. values? What's your core focus? Who's your target market? Um, what are the things that you actually solve for in terms of uniques? What's your 10-year target? And then, you know, how are you actually going to achieve that in terms of a plan? And the third thing, what would be the third thing? So delegate, elevate, get, get yourself a plan. What would be the third thing you would suggest? Be passionate. Or actually, let me change those words. Yeah. Get passionate. Right. So yeah. there's an awful lot of people who think passion and happiness uh, happen to you. Yep. They don't happen to you. You decide them. Mm-hmm. Um, because passion for something gets you up in the morning. It keeps you up at night when that's what's needed. Yes. It 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 gives you the reason to get out of bed in the morning because, you know, the thing you're going to is something you, you really want to go to, yeah. right? And it might be hard. I'm not saying it's always easy, but it's still something you're passionate about, solving or, or getting over, uh, et cetera. Um, and if you really can't get passionate about it, then you don't do it. Yeah. I just don't do it. So, um, so like I said, for me, I learned that very early on. Yeah. I, I'm passionate about the purpose of the industry. Yes. Yeah, absolutely, and learned that very, very early on. Um, and that's never changed. It's always been a key driver for me why I do what I do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I see lots of people who just do a job. Yeah, uh, and all they're interested in is themselves and how they look in that job until the next job. And mm-hmm. they destroy companies. And in the end, they end up being. I often they end up at a place where they're questioning what their point in life ever was. Yes. Uh, and that seems really sad to me. Mm-hmm. I, I think Most you want to be short. content that you you were who you wanted to be. Yeah. Yeah. And passion about something. 
is one of those things. I always say you need to do what you love with people you love. And I think um, people sort of think that maybe passion means they have to take their hobby and turn it into yeah. a thing, which is not true. I mean, yeah. Steve plays music, but that's yeah. not his actual yeah. um, job. He loves his numbers. That's what he actually really gets passionate about in his yeah. business. Uh, and the same thing with running a business. I think you've got to be passionate about what you do, but it doesn't have to be your hobby. No. Um, yeah. Or your only love. Yes, that's right. Yeah, but hopefully you've got lots of them. It's trying right. to pursue other things as well. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, so delegate and make sure you've got a plan and yeah, choose to be passionate. Yes. I mean, that's the thing. I think you're absolutely right. It is a choice. Yeah. And if you really can't choose to be passionate, then give it up and go and do something else because life you, is too short. How do you sell what you do to customers if you're not passionate? If you're not passionate. <laughs> I completely agree. I, just, <laughs> yeah. I get it. Oh, that is so wonderful. Hey, look, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming into the studio. Lovely to kind of spend some real time with you. Um, I've been fortunate to see you at various staff functions and things, but nice to actually have a really good chat about business. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Jeff.